Hello dudes, welcome to another Axel Tech video. So today, we're going to be going over my Linux video production workflow. I did do a video like this about a year ago or so, sometime a little over a year, I think. I think it was around last May, maybe. I'm, I might be totally off with that date. That's okay though. But anyway, I decided I wanted to redo it because some things have changed and I kind of wanted to do things in a much more organized and thought out manner. So without further ado, let's jump in. So to start things off, we're going to talk about the computer itself, what I produce everything on, my main production machine slash other everything else I do machine, except for VR games. So anyway, first things first, the operating system that I am running at the moment, it changes way more frequently than it should. I might have a problem. Don't worry, it's fine. What it is right now is Elementary OS 5.0 Juno, which is still in beta, so I'm not going to give too many thoughts on it at the moment, but um, it has been very stable and, and completely usable for me. But um, at the moment, as I said, it is still technically in beta, so I'm going to hold off on giving many more thoughts than that until the official final release occurs. So instead, let's take a look at the hardware that I'm running. So the hardware that powers my machine is a Ryzen 7 1700, a Sapphire Nitro Plus RX 578 GB, 16 GB of G-Skills, that yeah, G-Skill Ripjaws 5 RAM for my operating system slash home directory drive i use a samsung 960 evo 250 gigabyte nvme ssd for my games drive i use a samsung 850 evo 500 gigabyte ssd for my project files so recordings uh, renders exports all that sort of video -y stuff i have a western digital blue one terabyte sata 3 m.2 ssd all right, so let's talk pre-production. For whenever I do a video that requires a script, I just use LibreOffice and write it down in here. I don't always do scripts, but whenever I do need one, it's pretty straightforward. I open up LibreOffice Writer and I start writing. However, for my more informative slash talking head type videos, although this one doesn't feature my face a whole lot, I'm um, trying something a bit new. With this one, I'm using a program called Minder, which is basically a, um, I think it's called like a mind mapping thing. So basically, it's like you're brainstorming your idea, you write stuff down, it's node based, so you start with the central idea. Like for this example, this is my workflow, this is how I'm mapping out this video right now, actually. So when I, so like you can also assign each node a child node and then that child node can split into other child nodes and then each child node can have sibling nodes so it's kind of you know like a flow of information going through there you can also assign the nodes as tasks so when you complete a task you can mark that off and it'll show progress there so halfway done with the pre-production pre-production part of this recording woohoo and overall 53.3 percent complete although that's, that doesn't exactly weigh each task, but, you know, it's there. So, um, like I said, this is the first time I'm really using Minder, but um, it has been super helpful for organizing my thoughts, actually. So, um, I don't know if it's the best tool for the job. There is actually another program that's not currently available in elementary Juno's App Center. It is in the previous version, Loki's App Center, however. It's called Planner, which looks really cool, and I'd like to try that as well. I might, I might have to just compile that myself to try it out. But for now, Minder has been surprisingly helpful, so I will definitely keep using it. It's fantastic. All right, so that covers the programs that I use to prepare for the actual production, which is essentially recording footage, recording audio, all that sort of thing, and probably the backbone of my production workflow 
is OBS Studio. A lot of you are probably familiar with it. It is very popular among streamers. On it, It's available on Windows, Mac, and Linux. It is fan freaking tastic. You can do so much with it. You can record your desktop like I'm doing here. You can record a webcam like so. You could record from a capture device. Um, and also, you can record audio through it as well, like your microphones. You can do so much with OBS Studio. It is so, so versatile. But you can do so much with OBS Studio. I could not do what I do without OBS, so I am so happy it's available on Linux. Um, I'm not going to go into detail of like any tips or tricks for using it here, but if you're interested in OBS and you want to learn it, I can highly recommend the OBS Masterclass by Epos Vox. It's very extensive, has a lot of great information, but um, I am not in any way affiliated with him. It'd be cool if I was, but I'm not, but I can very highly recommend his OBS Masterclass. Go check it out. So OBS is the primary software I use for just about all of the recording that I need to do. But whenever I have to record like just a voiceover or something, if I'm going to put it like if I'm just going to put the voice over a clip that I already have or, you know, just a voiceover by itself. Usually I have used Audacity. A lot of you are probably familiar with it. It's been around a long time. It is very popular, available on all the major platforms, much like OBS. You can do a lot of basic editing with it, and it is a very, very handy bit of software. Um, so that's what I usually use. However, for this one, there's another new program I'm trying, much like Minder. I thought it was an elementary app at first, but no, it is, it is actually just a GNOME software application. Uh, this is just GNOME Sound Recorder. It's a lot simpler than Audacity, but it, it's not that bad actually. So you can't really, you can't edit your clips in it. This is more just you record something and then it just gets saved and then you do the editing later or something. So it's a lot simpler than Audacity, but um, if you're the kind of person who just like records the voiceover and then is going to edit it later, like when you're doing the video stuff, you might like it. Um, in my case, I have some gripes with it. So one thing that's kind of neat is when you do a recording, it'll automatically save it. That um, gets automatically saved to a recordings folder in your home directory you cannot change what folder it records the stuff to. So it has to go into that recordings folder first, and then you can you can move it afterwards, but it's, it, it's a little nitpick that I have against it, but overall it's not bad. As for actual recording options, um, there you can choose several different formats. You can do Og Vorbis, Opus, FLAC, MP3, or MOV? I thought that was a video format. Okay, you can do MOV as well. And you can do mono or stereo and change the the volume there is the um, playback volume because you can also play back the clips from this and then of course microphone volume so it's a pretty simple application but i am trying it out and it, it, it's not bad but i i might go back to audacity don't know yet we'll see so as we get into the post-production section of this we're going to, of course, talk about what I use as my video editing software. Now, up to this point, everything else that I've been using has been all free and open source and wonderful like that. The one exception that I make is when we get into video editing software. As you should already be able to see on screen here, I use DaVinci Resolve. It is not free and open source. There is a free to use version. But it is only free in that regard, as in price, not as in freedom, as in free and open source software. So why is Resolve the one exception that I make to that? I have used Caden Live quite extensively before. I have looked at OpenShot and Shotcut briefly. OpenShot always came across as both too simplistic and unstable. I haven't really looked at Shotcut too much, though. Maybe that's worth another look at some point. And as for Caden Live, I am somewhat familiar with it. Well, I shouldn't say somewhat. I am fairly familiar with it at this point. It's just, one, 
it's um it's good for simple projects but when you start to get to anything complex it's very unstable even on simple stuff it can be quite unstable at least the last time that i've used it it was and now I, I also should preface this a little bit by saying i have not really tried out the refactored version just yet i think that that's out in a stable release now i think but i have not actually tried it yet so that's probably also worth another try at some point but even considering all of that i don't think any of the other options any, any of the free and open source options right now come close to what I can get with like DaVinci Resolve. I know um, a good number of people also like Lightworks. I have tried that as well. The workflow in Lightworks is really weird for someone who's used to other things. But I mean, if you're brand new to video editing on Linux anyway, you could try Lightworks, see if you like that kind of workflow. But yeah, so for me, Resolve works best. So one of the limitations with using Resolve as my video editor of choice is that um, on Linux, with the free version, you can't import clips that are encoded in, uh, that are encoded in H.264. So if you're like me and you're using OBS and you're not doing any custom FFmpeg output, you're just doing the standard stuff, it will output to um, H.264. So I had to transcode it. Now, for some people, they don't want to have to wait extra long to get into their editing, you know, whatever, you do you. For me, it is worth it. So, what I do is I have a bash script that I wrote just uses FFmpeg for uh, converting my recorded clips into a codec that is usable by Resolve. I use ProRes, I don't know if that's the best option. But it has been working for me so far, so I see no reason to try anything else at the moment. So once the edit is complete and I've got the video rendered and stuff and I'm getting ready to go to the release phase of things, one more thing that I don't always do, I probably should do more often, but I don't always do, is uh, making a custom thumbnail for the video. And there's two programs I kind of flip between for whenever I do so. The first one, most of you have probably heard of. It is probably one of the most popular free and open source softwares out there. That is GIMP, the GNU image manipulation program. Many people, of course, use it as an alternative to Photoshop. And, you know, it, it does do the job pretty well. But um, one thing it does not do quite so well is, like, simple layer effects most notably in my use case, adding like an outline or a drop shadow to text. You have to do that manually. And it's very tedious if say, for example, you're doing a let's play and you need to, uh, like you're doing the same thumbnail pretty much for a lot of the things, but the text is in like the same spots, but you need to just change the number. You have to completely redo the effect manually each time just to change the number. It's not great. So, um, the other, program that I like to use is uh, Krita, which is technically more focused as being a um, digital drawing, pro like a painting, like digital painting, not drawing, digital painting program. But um, it actually does also have image manipulation capabilities, of course, and it also has a layer styles feature, kind of like what Photoshop has which means it's a heck of a lot easier to, say, do an outline or a drop shadow on text. So, yeah, that, that's kind of a very specific thing, but it is a thing to keep in mind. So, yeah, um, in overall image editing, GIMP is probably still better, but Krita is great as well. It's, it's very hard to choose. As I'm recording this voiceover, I don't even know which one I'm demonstrating right now. So, I guess we'll see once we get to that point. So, once editing is done, the video is rendered out from Resolve, and I've made the thumbnail if I chose to make one. After that point, I uh, release my videos on both PeerTube and YouTube. Now, with PeerTube, I have a limited amount of space to work with, so using the same transco.sh script from earlier, I convert the output from Resolve into uh, H.265 or HEVC, which is a lot smaller but still retains the perceivable quality of the original video. 
so it makes it a lot smaller, which is better for uh, getting that on PeerTube. So after I've done that transcode, I then uh, I'll start getting the video uploaded to PeerTube, and after that, also on YouTube. So how I've been releasing them lately is I upload it to PeerTube, and that's it goes public as soon as it's done transcoding. And then with the YouTube release, usually that comes out the day after at noon, but sometimes on occasion I will release the YouTube video a little bit, um, like a couple hours or so after the PeerTube release occurs if it's something that I want to get out sooner on YouTube. Like this video, for example, this one is probably going to go on YouTube the same day it goes on PeerTube. Probably. Not sure yet. We'll see. All right, so um, that about covers it for my video production workflow from start to finish. I am happy, like as I was going through this, I am happy to confirm slash realize, hey, I am doing this with almost entirely free and open source software. Neat. With, of course, the one big exception, DaVinci Resolve. But other than that, all free and open source. Even if there is one exception to that, I'm still happy with that overall. So... I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope this has helped some people realize, okay, it's it's definitely possible to do video production on Linux. I'm not gonna claim that it's just as good on Linux. I'm not gonna claim that it's better or anything. I'm just saying it is definitely possible and definitely doable. So that being said, of course, if you guys have any questions, Feel free to ask either in the comments or over at me on uh, linuxrocks.online slash at Axel. That's a Mastodon instance. You can also hit me up on Twitter if you'd like. Till next time, this has been Axel. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.